everyone, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy, my favorite state. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And that's a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm pleased again, yet again, to welcome our guest, Toby Kincaid, our true pioneer in the solar industry who I've known for what, almost 35, 40 years going now, not quite 40 years, <laughs> but a long time. And uh, he's, he just got over COVID and he's a real champ. He should have been a submariner because he has a real get up and go attitude, which I love. So welcome to the show, uh, Toby. And Thank we're going to uh, we're, we're going to delve into your history of solar. And you have a lot of knowledge about the solar industry. I mean, you form most of it, I think. Um, but we're going to have a brief history of the solar industry. So, Toby, over to you. And um, I think a good place to start is just uh, to start it off is uh, tell us what is solar energy anyway, just as a background to get us all into, into the subject. Sure. Well, all of the ancients knew that the whole world is solar powered. So it's a very intimate thing. But back in the day, everyone kind of thought solar energy was one thing, sunlight. Actually, that's kind of a misnomer. It really should be called sunlight. So back in, in time, let's go back to uh, 1666. Isaac Newton famously painted his dorm room black. The windows were all black. And he scraped off a little bit of the paint so a little beam of light could come in. And when he was developing his work on optics, he would put this prism in and he'd say, oh, that's extraordinary. Sunlight isn't one thing, it's seven things, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And this was an extraordinary thing because now sunlight was many things and it had a lot of intrigue. Well, when Newton developed his optique, he really taught us there's two kinds of optics, geometric optics, where the wavelength doesn't matter, and physical optics, where the wavelength really matters. So. In geometric optics, for example, if you had a reflector, you might have heard of angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Well, that's true right. no matter what the wavelength is. But when Newton put his prism there and, and, and refracted those lights out, oh my goodness, all those different colors, that really kind of was a game changer. And that's physical optics where the wavelength really matters. So if you take a stick and put it in a glass of water and you see it bend, that's the different wavelengths traveling through water at different speeds. So Isaac Newton kind of opened the door that sunlight is far more involved than simply one thing. Well, then we fast forward to 1799, and Sir Herschel, Sir William Herschel, climbed a mountain, and he wanted to duplicate Newton's experiment. So he put up a tent, cut a hole in it, had a beam of light go in, put a prism there, and he had a table, and he had his red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And what he wanted to do is, is ask the question, hey, do each color, do they have different temperatures? So he started putting thermometers on each of the colors, kind of kind of interesting. Right. Well, yeah. he brought more thermometers than he needed, so he put a few off to the right and started making his measurements. And then famously, he kind of looks over and notices, oh my goodness, beyond the red where there shouldn't be anything, all of my thermometers are hot. What's going on? What's this? And he said, there must be something in the solar spectrum which we cannot see, but definitely has a lot of energy. And he discovered infrared. So now the seven colors of light became eight. So then in the same spirit, uh, Johann uh, Ritter said, okay, what about the other side? Is there some energy we can't see on the other side of light, beyond no. the violet? And so he took some photographic paper very early on, which is just paper and silver chloride. And they noticed if you put that in the sun, it turns black really fast. But if you shine yellow light or red light or blue light or green light, it, it, it wouldn't uh, turn black very rapidly. But as you move towards the shorter wavelengths, towards the blues and the indigo and the violet, it would accelerate and turn black faster and faster. So I thought, okay, I'm going to repeat the experiment of, of Sir Herschel, and then I'm going to put some of this photographic paper beyond the violet and see what happens. And lo and behold, it turned black. And he goes, oh, my goodness. There is energy in the solar spectrum shorter than the violet, what we call now ultraviolet. And this now turns seven, eight. Now we have nine things in sunlight. Wow. So, you know, it's a really kind of an amazing optical soup of all these different colors. 
Well, there was a big mystery in the 1800s. They, just, they knew about ultraviolet light, and when they were experimenting with electricity, they would shine it onto some metal, and they noticed that electricity was formed. Now, when they shine red light and orange light and yellow light and blue light, nothing happened. But when they shine ultraviolet light on metal, suddenly electricity is happening, and they're like, what's going on? Oh. Well, no way to understand this. And the whole mystery wasn't solved until 1905. And in 1905, Einstein published these five papers, the special relativity, general relativity, a couple of papers on drowning and movement, which is how atoms would drift around. But his fifth paper changed the world. And that was the photoelectric step. And what he pointed out was, and this is his famous equation, that if you can see it on the screen, uh, what he said is the energy you're measuring in the electricity, the kinetic energy of the electrons, is going to equal the energy of the photon minus D. And D was the working function of the material, kind of the resistance of the material. So he defined light as HF. The energy would be Planck's constant, this really small number, times the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And this turned out to be absolutely revolutionary. Now, there's kind of an analog in music. So if I make a tone, dum, bum, if I have that higher tone, what's happening? Well, I've doubled the frequency. So the ancient Greeks knew, for example, if you took a string, stretch it tight and pluck it, you get a sound, dum. Then if you pinch it halfway and pluck it, you get bum, an octave higher. You doubled the frequency. So this was kind of a really important realization that Every color of light contains more energy. And the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Now, this turns out to be the father, the turning point of not only solid state physics and photovoltaics making electricity directly from sunlight, but this is the basis of all of our modern uh, solid state devices, all came back to Einstein's equation, where everyone thinks of E equals mc squared, but, you know, that's esoteric. But as, as far as this equation of the, the kinetic energy of electricity equals the energy of a photon minus the work function of a material, that was incredible. And so wow. he set up the basis now for how a, a photovoltaic cell works. And what they do briefly is they, they take two sheets of silicon and they, they diffuse some boron on one side and on the other sheet they put some phosphorus. Now boron, has one less electron than silicon. So relative to silicon, it's more positive. And then with the phosphorus, it has one more electron than silicon. So it's more negative. And when you put the positive and the negative, the P and the N junction together, you have a solar cell. And what they do is they put some grids, some wires on the top and on the back, and you connect a wire from the front through a light or some load to the back. And Einstein tells us that because silicon, for example, has this work function, this band gap, they call it, of 1.1 electron volts. So Einstein's saying, if you want to make electricity, anything below that, below the red light, longer in wavelength, you won't make a single electron. But if you get above 1.1 electron volts, hey, you're going to start knocking out electrons. And so Einstein really gave us our modern world with this uh, uh, photoelectric effect. And we've got this amazing spectrum of these. It's not sunlight as one broadband spectrum. That's not quite accurate. It's actually a collection of these very narrow bands. And now, with all of this together, we can do three major things with solar energy. With the longer wavelengths, we could do photothermal, so you're going to heat something up. In the visible and middle wavelengths, you can do photovoltaics, as long as the electron has more energy than the band gap. And that's what Einstein taught us. And then you have the higher wavelengths doing photochemistry. And the most important, of course, would be photosynthesis, which uses a very narrow band of red and a narrow, very narrow band of blue. And you drive all of the photosynthesis that, that actually provides all the oxygen on Earth and all of the base nutrition. So even if you ate an animal that only eats meat, eventually you're going to have an animal down the food chain that ate a plant. So it's the plant kingdom that is, is our lifeblood here on, on planet Earth. So that sets the scene that solar energy is a really dynamic. If you were to look at the sun, you would see all different points of light, all different colors, all going everywhere. And so this was the basis of, of our modern understanding of, of 
solar energy. Well, that's so, totally fascinating, you know, and, and you know, that was what, in the 1700s? That's not that long ago, I don't think. Yeah, we've come a long ways in, in, a, in a couple of centuries, and it's certainly after Einstein, here, as you say, a century later, and we do things they would have never imagined. So right. solar energy is dynamic, and it, it provides, well, can provide everything we need. So, so uh, the ancient Greeks uh, captured solar energy. How about telling us a little bit about what they did? That was back in the BC, BC before oh, Christ. Yeah, yeah, this goes back now. Now, how do humans use solar energy? Well, let's go back or forward from when we were talking about to 25 centuries ago, so 5th or 6th century BC. Now, wow. the Greeks had a problem. They didn't have any fuel. This is the Bronze Age, and everyone's burning wood. So where do you get wood? In the 4th century BC, it was a death sentence if you cut down an olive tree to, to make charcoal or to burn it. It was so vital to the economy. So yeah. the idea of an energy crisis dogs every civilization through time. Well, so they didn't have any wood. So uh, Socrates, for example, he used to say that uh, the ideal house would be cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And so what, what a concept <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful philosophy of life right so in architecture what the greeks figured out is if they did the first of the east west north south streets so that everyone had access to solar energy actually access to solar energy was a human right long before the idea of voting for anything so it's kind of an amazing the kind of humanity that they recognize that everyone has to have some heat and some light and so with architecture, what the, what the uh, Greeks did, and they were really freaked out about this, this uh, deforestation. Uh, I remember Plato uh, wrote poems of lament of his dear Attica, that it was deforested and all the soft and rich parts have fallen away and, and that only the bees can survive, you know, because everything was cut down. So this was a big issue. So they thought about it and realized, okay, let's start innovating something. They took any window or door, and above it, they would create an eave. So during the high sun, it would shade. But when the sun was low in the winter, it was allowed access into the portico or into the, into wow. the windows and buildings. And so on that picture, you can kind of see where they had all of these things that they would recommend that you would. Now, here you have kind of a portico in the center where you had a cistern. So the southern part is kind of the lower right-hand side. And you could see the slope would allow the sunlight at low angles to reach the northern part of the house and go in through the portico and into the, into the uh, north-facing rooms. And it would heat up the floor, and they would have that radiant heat. So you can imagine people padding around on the warm stones you know, in winter. Fantastic. And, and Socrates and many others had all kinds of advice. If you're going to build a second story, you build it on the north side. So you Because if you build it on the south side, you'd shade the rooms in the north, you didn't want to do that. So all of these techniques, and here you have this house, which not only had lighting and heating through the winter, but you also had the roofs collecting rainwater and the cistern in the center. So what a remarkable, sustainable yeah. way to have a house uh, 25 centuries ago. Yeah, and they didn't have computers in those days to figure it all out like we did. I guess they all they had like a scroll of papyrus, and they draw it out and figure it out and think about oh. it. Oh, very much. And, and, and then execute it and, and experiment. It's really fascinating Amazing. to hear you talk about this. Amazing. So solar energy wasn't just esoteric to the ancient Greeks. It was life to the ancient Greeks. Right. Yeah. So now let's move forward in history and let's uh, maybe go to the ancient Romans. Now, the greenhouse effect was long known by the Romans. They had the hypocaust where they would burn wood and had hollow walls and floors to heat up their baths. But they noticed that they had usually three baths, a very hot one, a medium one, and a cool one. And in the medium one, they simply would make some windows to the top, put some glass glazing over it, and not only did you get light in the bath, but it would actually help trap heat. Now, Caesar was famous for loving uh, um, the uh, a particular fruit, I'm trying to remember, cucumbers. He loved cucumbers. So he had his uh, his gardeners create little greenhouses so that they could move it around during the winter time and grow cucumbers for the emperor. So, uh, you know, the greenhouse effect was very long understood. 
And so by the ancients, they were they made tremendous use of of solar energy technology in the most practical way they could. And, and that's kind of fascinating because they had a big fuel problem. Would you know by the third century BC, a third of Italy was denuded of trees. Everyone was burning wood because how are you going to cook? How are you going to get some heat? And most importantly, how are you going to smelt iron? Now, the Bronze Age, that was copper and tin, and you're still making high temperature. But when we get to iron, they had to make 3,000 degrees, lots of wood. So the, right. the, the Romans had a, a fleet, uh, Navacari Lombardi, something of that nature in, in Latin, uh, ship fleets. And they would send around soldiers and stop somewhere, deploy some soldiers. The rest of them would cut down the trees, hew the trees, uh, big dig pits and throw the trees in and light them on fire and then cover it with dirt. In a couple of weeks, it would leach out all the impurities and you're left with charcoal and they would import that back. So the idea of wood and fuel was a massive problem for the ancient Romans. They actually imported wood from the Caucasus, which was a thousand miles away from Rome. So this was wow. energy crises always dogs everybody. Okay, so, so moving, <laughs> moving forward to the 1830s, when people actually started to cook with solar, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Now, we're kind of jumping and passing over like 2,000 years. So what was the big thing in that brief period, and I don't have a drawing for you, was burning years. Now, back in the ancient Greeks, one of the things they did in Greece is they take a little bowl and, and pound some, some silver really thin or gold, and they would make a reflector, and the Vestal Virgins would start the holy fire from the golden rays of the sun. And so there was no pollution of men making fire. And even in Mesoamerica, we see that they did the same thing. And all the villagers would run up to the temple many miles away, and they would light the fire from this initial fire, bring all the, the flames all the way back to the villages, and then everyone would start their fire. And so it was this holy connection to the life-giving energy of the sun. In, right. in Mesoamerica, the gold was actually tears of the sun. So just wonderful romantic notions. Okay, so I'm gonna fast forward, burning mirrors were the thing, and they made them larger and larger. Uh, Francis Bacon in the 13th century proposed burning mirrors for the crusaders in the crusades. He, he was thrown in jail and, and for probably a variety of things, but he was quite outspoken. But so the idea of burning mirrors was a really big thing. Okay, so now we've jumped forward to the 1830s, late 1830s. And here we have the father of concentrating solar energy. His name is Augustine Machaut. And Machaut was a French brilliant mathematician, later a professor. But when he was a young man, he went to the French Academy of Sciences and said, hey, give me a grant because I have some designs for solar cooking and other apparatus that would be great for the French Foreign Legion. Now, the French Foreign Legions were in mostly in North Africa, so you have Morocco and Libya. There's no trees, there's no wood. So if you have 200 soldiers and they're doing whatever soldiers do, and they come back to the commissary, what are you gonna feed them? Some cold gruel or something? So the Academy of Sciences said, oh, sacre bleu, c'est magnifique, you know. S'il vous plaît, monsieur, you do it. And so he traveled there and the soldiers loved him because if, if you hold up that slide, what he did in the beginning is he designed these little tripods and he had the little reflectors that would fold out like an upside down umbrella and they pounded silver very thin in these little slats and then in the middle he put a carafe or kind of a hot pot and you'd put in your potatoes your carrots your onions put in a little wine uh, a little meat if you have fish put fish and rabbits rabbits okay so he uh, put a little beef if you're lucky and salt and pepper and close it up and so for four or five hours in the hot sun in Libya, someone would come around and kind of adjust it and move it manually to follow the sun. And then at the end of the day, everyone had this fantastic beef stew that was it's like a solar crock pot. And it was just delicious. And you know, the, the two cultures that to me, the French and the, and the Japanese take their food very seriously. So for the French, it was quite extraordinary. And so Machaut was really on a path here, and he was extraordinary. Now, on that lower part of, the, of, that, of that drawing, you'll see where he did something revolutionary. He combined two things that have never been combined before. He took the light trapping glass of a greenhouse and combined it with a burning mirror. 
So what he did is he took this kind of glass fixture and put an insert of metal inside and then put, you put in your potatoes and carrots and everything else. And then you, you cover the top and then put it in the sun. And the sunlight would warm up one half of it. But the, to get the back side or the north side, he put this burning mirror reflector a couple of feet back and it would shine on the back. And after, again, four or five hours, you would have the most delectable stew. And you imagine, you know, you think of army rations being pretty tough. Imagine in the middle 1800s what they were. But the French were, were enjoying these wonderful these wonderful home-cooked meals. You know, they loved Machot. And then oh, on that bottom one, Machot did something really extraordinary. Is He took off the top, put a bunch of wine in it, and then he had a bulb that he would put on the top with a little flute coming off, and that was a condenser. And so when you heat the wine with the sun, the, the alcohol would evaporate at a lower temperature than the water, go up, hit the top bulb, and then kind of seep through that little flute and give up heat and condense into liquid and would drip into the most marvelous brandy. So here he's wow. filling wine with <laughs> brandy. <laughs> yeah, you got to love the French. No, very practical. But everyone was thrilled with this guy. And he also built water distillers. And that was a big thing for all around the world, like in, the, in Indonesia or in, in uh, uh, Indochina, where they had different colonies, is you couldn't drink the water. There's too many uh, diseases. You had to boil it. That took lots of fuel. So it was a great innovation. He started building distillers. And he, this guy was amazing. And then the next slide, uh, if you go to that, he did another thing is he created a water pump that had no moving parts, no fuel costs. And what he did, if you could see, it's kind of hard to see, but on the right-hand side, they would put water in this vessel, which had a glass top and kind of a metal bell jar inside. They'd fill it halfway up with water and then have a feed tube. They had a valve on the right side you'd turn off. So once you, you prime it and then put the tube into the water you wanted to draw, you just let it sit. It wouldn't drain out because it's kind of a hydrostatically would hold the water there. But what happens is the sunlight goes through the glass, heats up the bell jar. The bell jar would heat up the internal air, and the air would expand and push on that column. And instead of, you know, nature takes the path of least resistance, so it couldn't push the water back down the well, but it could, when you open the valve, push it up that little thing to the left, that, that little tube, and it would lift the water, you know, a meter high or something, a couple feet up. And, and everyone was astounded. Now, it wasn't a very powerful water pump, but here you have Machot designing and building quite an engineer himself, as well as a mathematics prodigy. And he became a professor at Tours in, in mathematics. But his dream was to power steam engines. Ah, yeah. yeah. We France, have something about that. Oh, yeah. Now, France had an energy crisis, like, you know, like we've heard before. And they were trying to compete with England in the first industrial revolution. Well, England had lots of coal and it was near the surface and they had railroads that were coming online and they only got to go kind of a short distance. France was at a big disadvantage. Now they had coal, but it was way south in the Pyrenees. And so they didn't really have the railroads to bring it. So Machel goes back to the Academy of Sciences and said, I'd like a grant to develop larger and larger steam engines. And they said, oh, that would lose. You know, wonderful, go for it. So he started building these large steam engines. And if you go to the next slide, I, I say in the 1870s, but there was a lot of trouble in the 1870s. Uh, Napoleon III declares war on Prussia. Prussia promptly goes in and sacks half of France. So they had a problem there, but they got to his lab and the, the Prussians took everything. 30 years of all his prototypes, all his work, his library, all his papers, he was wiped out. And I think it kind of gave him almost a mental uh, breakdown. Poor Michel. But he had an assistant called Pith Ray. And Pith Ray said, I want to continue your work. And he said, please, please continue this. So what you're seeing is kind of my sketch of a woodblock I saw from 1879, 1880. And there was the Paris Exposition. And so here's Pith Ray building this big steam engine that would shine a conic reflector like he developed before onto the central boiler. And he ran a steam engine with all the Parisians walking by with top hats and parasols. And he ran a steam engine that ran a printing press and, and would print out bills that say, hey, you're just looking at a solar produced printing. You know, this is 1880. So 
Defre was taking on what Machot had developed. And Machot, this was around the world, people were astounded by this. How could you run a steam engine with solar energy? And how could you do it in Paris? It's not a really sunny right. place. Right, right. So the big thing that everyone was really trying to do was water pumping. Because you know, this is a time when they didn't have the modern oil age. They didn't, electricity was just not quite yet until the 1890s. So the idea of farmers everywhere around the world trying to pump water, they had to bring, they had to run a steam engine with coal or wood. But that was problematic. If you're a remote farm, how are you going to get all this fuel? So Machot had this dream. He wanted to set the world free, an industrial revolution of solar energy. So an extraordinary man in what he did. Okay. Okay. okay so right. now we've got a the... minute. We've got a minute and a half. Oh, oh, uh, oh! So soon. I'm so sorry. Okay. Next slide. So this is uh, uh, inspired. What Machot did inspired the work by Aeneas, and Aeneas had an ostrich farm in Pasadena, California, an ostrich farm. And what he did is he he breeded ostriches for the feathers. And he'd sell the feathers back east in New York for the women's hats. Made a fortune. Anyway, he was very enterprising, so he started selling tickets. And I remember one of his ads I remember reading. It said, come on the weekend and visit Pasadena to see the ostriches. And for no extra charge, see the solar motors. And so what Machot did, uh, based on Machot, what Aeneas did, is he built a really big Machot conical concentrator as a water pump. Now, Aeneas had 300 acres of an orchard of citrus, and he was lucky because his water table was very shallow. It's only like 16 feet, but his engine pumped, get this, 1,400 gallons a minute. I had to look it up to wow. be sure. Yeah, a minute. And everyone in Southern California and in Arizona, they're thinking, oh, this is going to be something incredible. And this is in the 1890s. But we'll go fast. So we'll jump to the next slide. Now, he had some problems. A windstorm destroyed it, unfortunately. And so now I'm going to go back to the, to the Civil War and talk about John Erickson. Now, John Erickson was the most famous nautical engineer in the, in the world. Everyone knew him because he invented the Monitor, the first ironclad of the Civil War. And he has, I think, 114 patents based on ships. He invented the propeller. So he said, after the war, I'm going to devote my life to solar engines so that we can, we can grow food everywhere in the world and poverty could be eliminated. He, he had some, I didn't, I, we don't have time, but I, and I didn't write them down, but he had some beautiful quotes about how much he wanted to save the world. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So Erickson set up, he set up this uh, parabolic trough concentrator. Okay, he had some trouble as well. And then he was inspired or inspired a guy named Frank Schumann. Now, Frank Schumann was amazing because he went to Egypt and said, I'm going to build a big one. These are 200 feet long, these parabolic troughs, which would concentrate the sunlight down in the center line. And he put some tubes, and he was building a big water pumping system. Well, in 1911, his tubes were all made of zinc, and they melted. I mean, as I read some of the newspaper articles. They said, like, wilted rags. And, and so he goes, ah, and he, I'm too good. I'm too hot. So he replaced them all with cast iron. And by 1913, he was pumping in the desert in Egypt for a cotton plantation, 6,000 gallons a minute. Wow. It was astounding. The whole world was just, oh, my God, we're going to see this tremendous solar revolution. And, of course, unfortunately, World War I happened, and he was backed by Germans all in Deutschmarks. So when the war happened, all his money was worthless and, and the, eventually went into disrepair. But he had this wonderful photograph of women with their parasols walking around looking at this incredible solar machine that's going to change the nature of the world and pump water for all the farmers everywhere. So okay. are, are we running out of time? Uh, I don't, we're, not, we're out of time. Oh, so. I'm sorry. Okay, we'll have to stop there. But so the, yeah. the, the, the quick takeaway would be that solar technology has evolved and humans have strived to make use of it. And boy, can we. We can do, Masho pointed out, and later Erickson and Aeneas and Schumann, that you can do all of these things very practically. And this is 120 years ago. So, you know, it's amazing what these guys did. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there, Toby. I'd love to spend another half hour with you, but we only had the 30 minutes. So, so you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. 
And today we've been talking story with, with Toby, who has a fascinating history of uh, solar energy, and I could listen to it again. Maybe we'll have you come back for a, a second half. And, um, and how smart these people were, all the way back to the ancient uh, Greeks, uh, all the way up to like the late 1800s. It's amazing uh, what we have. So thank you so much, Toby, for educating us on this fascinating uh, history. Thank you. And thanks to our visitors, I mean, our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks uh, with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Mm -hmm.